From Miami Law, I'm Annette Uges, and this is The Explainer. So this is why, actually, I love bankruptcy and why I was encouraged my students to take it. It's it's this fascinating procedure that can like solve and it's, requires solving a vast array of issues, torts, environmental law, labor issues. All of this ends up coming into one sort of one proceeding with a very tight deadline mm-hmm. because the cash is running out. So I think these cases in many ways I'll be fascinating to follow, but I, I hope illustrate like or give some insight into why would anyone want to study bankruptcy. Welcome back to the Miami Law Explainer, the legal affairs podcast where Miami law experts lend context and historical relevance to today's headlines. Pier One has struggled for years to bring a younger audience to the Beads and Candle Emporium. Boy Scouts of America has been roiled over sex abuse allegations going back decades. McClatchy, owner of 30 American newspapers, has suffered from the rise of digital media. All three companies filed for bankruptcy in the past weeks. Vice Dean and bankruptcy expert Drew Dawson calculates the odds of survival. Let's go to executive producer Catherine Skip with the interview. Hey, Drew, welcome back to The Explainer. Thanks for having me, Catherine. Always. Um, Three very different but really big companies all announced uh, bankruptcy filings in the last week or so. What what ties them together and what sets them apart? Yeah, pretty exciting times for bankruptcy law. We get big filings and what they're all different in such important ways. What brings them, well, maybe what they have in common is that they help illustrate sort of the breadth of bankruptcy law and how... Companies fail for all sorts of different reasons, and yet they end up, bankruptcy provides a procedure for helping to resolve these in one central forum. So I guess if I were to look at the three of these, I'd say, wow, you know, bankruptcy allows this sort of powerful, sweeping sort of procedure that can draw in and help resolve problems that range from the Boy Scouts in the wake of all the allegations of sexual abuse claims to... Pier One, which is just sort of a dead business model of selling products that people no longer really want. Mm-hmm. And all of that ends up before a bankruptcy judge and which who oversees a collective proceeding that can help maximize value. And McClatchy, kind of the same. And McClatchy's like- sort of the same, right? A company trying to adjust to the changing marketplace. And bankruptcy law can't save that. Bankruptcy law can't sort of, you know provide a solution to the competition from sort of online news sources. But we see bankruptcy as a place to sort of collectively bring all the stakeholders into one proceeding to try to come up with some sort of collective solution. Mm -hmm. And they're all Chapter 11s? They're all Chapter 11s. They all file Chapter 11. Now, they may not all... Chapter 11, we typically think of as the reorganization chapter. Like, if you want to come out as a going concern, Chapter 11 is the way where you would go as opposed to a chapter seven where you're basically turning the keys in to the bank and saying, here you go, you take over. Mm -hmm. At the same time, chapter 11 has increasingly been used as a sort of an orderly liquidation vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so even though let's say Pier 1 is going in as a chapter 11, that doesn't mean Pier 1 is going to emerge as Pier 1. It may in fact end up being liquidated just in an orderly manner. Mm -hmm. More of a hail mary. There's a bit of a hail mary. It's also it's a it's a it's a slow fall, a soft fall. As whereas chapter seven, we would just be like sort of pulling the plug and start liquidating everything. Chapter eleven allows for more of a structured liquidation that may take place over the course of years Mm -hmm. to sort of wind down. And what they're doing very early on is sort of deciding, let's find which stores are the biggest losers, mm-hmm. and let's dump those right away. Maybe we liquidate those. But there are some of the entities that are actually profitable that may be worth something and hold on to those and then figure out, is this a long-term play where we think we can actually revive the company? Or is it more keep these companies in their good locations and come up with a long-term plan that might inv- involve selling itself or selling those locations, selling its brand to the few remaining retailers that are 
profitable. Mm -hmm. While hoping that wicker and incense like come way back. That could happen. <laughs> You'd wait it out, wait out the, the incense But there's market. still, uh, chapter 11 is they, they feel that there's still value, there's still something to s sell rather than, than just saying, wow, this didn't work. They have to figure out what's a value. And the chapter 11 gives them the time to figure out what we have of value. And this is something that's been really interesting to watch in the retail industry. Because you know, a lot of stores have gone into bankruptcy and most of them haven't come out. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of Borders, Circuit City, we're like on the early edge of this. But you know, we see Forever 21 is going into bankruptcy. Sears? Uh, Sears bankruptcy, which has gone on for quite some time. Mm -hmm. A lot of what it's doing is it allows the major creditors, those with the largest stake in this, to actually kind of slow play and sort of figure out, identify the areas of value and find a seller at a good price, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of the fire sale market, what, which a chapter seven would bring on. And so for Pier 1, it's, it's, what's really interesting here is that if this had happened maybe five years ago, you would end up thinking, we're not really, Pier 1 is not a company that sells beads and like funky chairs. We're a company with really good real estate at a lot of malls. And what the lenders might be doing in the bankruptcy is actually trying to find someone who would really value that package of retail locations. Mm -hmm. On the tail end of the sort of the wave of retail bankruptcies, it's really unclear what's going to happen. Who wants a spot at a mall these days? Right. Unless you're going to use it for Amazon storage. There you go. Right. Right. So that's going to be tricky as they go through this. But what the bankruptcy does is it allows all of those collective decisions about what to do with Pier 1 to be decided in one single forum and let those decisions be binding on everybody. Okay. And it gives them a little bit more time to think through that plan of like, how do we maximize the value of whatever Pier 1 is, mm -hmm. which is going to be, again, it's physical locations, which may be valuable to dollar stores, like Tuesday morning type of stores. Pay less. Pay less, right? Or, or what's the checkbook, the one where you go put your paycheck in and then they charge you. Oh, the check cashing stores. Yeah, check cashing yeah, Payday <laughs> lenders. Is it valuable to them? Who's it valuable right. to? Right, who wants that kind of space? And who wants the IP? Mm -hmm. Is there still value in the brand Pier 1? For instance, you know, when Twinkies went bankrupt, the best thing they had was just the name Twinkies. Mm -hmm. That's where the value is. They'll get some time to determine, is there really some value still associated with Pier 1 that someone might want to buy as Pier1.com and keep operating the business that way? We saw that with um, Sharper Image mm -hmm. when they went bankrupt. It still exists online. Someone bought that intellectual property. Well, we see that, and it gives some time for them to market that and try to maximize the value of the assets. Mm -hmm. um, with the Boy Scouts, a lot of that Chapter 11 seems to have to do with the assets uh, on protecting all the Boy Scout real estate, the camps, yeah. and, and things like that, correct? It has to do with that. It also has to try to do with stopping a lot of these uh, these. Uh, sexual abuse lawsuits from going forward against the local chapters mm -hmm. too, right? Because that's where the money comes into the Boy Scouts unit. Right. And so the really the, the power of Chapter 11 here is not so much like Pier 1 was like, give them the time to figure out what do they own that has any value. Mm -hmm. This is different. This is let's stop all these lawsuits the drip from, drip drip, the drip, the drip from that's happening all over the country there's mm -hmm. thousands of these pending right mm -hmm. over a thousand maybe not thousands but over a thousand of these pending by the bankruptcy filing now it funnels all of those cases to a single bankruptcy court you don't the boy scouts don't have to have legal counsel all over in a thousand mm -hmm. cases everything comes into one court and that helps centralize it, which does provide some benefits to the debtors, obviously, to the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. It also maybe provides a way of providing for a solution, even a structured solution for the victims. Okay. That is, and the, if all the thousand lawsuits were allowed to proceed against the Boy Scouts, we might expect that the money would run out at lawsuit number 25. Mm-hmm. 
And the first 25 people who collect would get paid, but that would leave everyone else, right? The other 975 law- right. people, they might win their lawsuit, but there's nothing left in the piggy bank for mm-hmm. them to collect from. The collective nature of the Chapter 11 might provide for setting up and creating a, a, a fund, like a trust fund, that could provide a, sort of a, a place where everyone, even lawsuit number 1,000, there would still be something in the piggy bank when they right. won their lawsuit. It would all divide out somewhat equally. Right. It becomes much more of a victim's compensation fund, which could be created legislatively. In some ways, it's helpful to think of it as sort of like the 9-11 compensation fund, where we have a pool of money that you know those who suffered harm could collect from. Mm-hmm it would ultimately create something more like that and away from that piecemeal litigation sort of model Mm -hmm. that's currently going on. That would provide, A, a way for the Boy Scouts to keep working, and B, a way of like having a fund that would ensure that there's some money left for all these lawsuits. And it's not over, right? The lawsuit allegations keep coming as more states start lengthening the statute of limitations Mm -hmm. for these claims we might expect to see even more of these lawsuits. Mm-hmm. And we, I'm just to go back to it, so does that somehow protect their, their real estate assets? For the Boy Scouts? Right. Right. Was this something the Catholic Church did where they, they tried to protect the real estate, the buildings, outside of, of the claims against the clergy? Very, it's very similar to yeah, what the Catholic Church and similar claims of sexual abuse. It, it puts... The assets, certain of the assets are going to be out of the reach. The trade-off is they're going to make sure that there are other assets that will be available for the creditors. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it'll be up to the court to decide, was that a fair plan as to the victims? I mean, uh, that is, if you're going to be able to hold on to some of your assets, so the the church or the Boy Scout, let's hold on to some of our assets Mm -hmm. so that we can keep on in business is enough being allocated to the victims where we feel like that's a fair trade-off, that mm-hmm. both parties are better off as a group. Right, because it remains against, pri- profitable and it remains yeah. taking in income. And, and, and if then, there were no intervention at all, again, the Boy Scouts end up like being bankrupt, like literally when we say bankrupt, filing bankruptcy doesn't mean you're bankrupt. You don't have to be insolvent to file bankruptcy. They'd have to take girls. Oh, they Ooh. already did. But if they end up insolvent... That doesn't really help anybody. Mm-hmm. They're out of business, and there's no but there's no money left for the right. victims to recover from. So, do we have the right trade off, and how do we balance that? Mm-hmm. And McClatchy. McClatchy's a, another really interesting one. It, locally, I guess folks are interested in this because they own our local Miami newspaper, mm-hmm. right? the Miami Herald. Um, they have multiple newspaper operations around the country. This is an old, old family-run business. The Chapter 11 is a pretty fascinating sort of proceeding in a way for, again, because they are so widespread, their holdings are so widespread, we can actually bring everything within a single court proceeding. So this is what ties all the cases together, right? Mm-hmm. The collective decision-making process. And then try to come up with a strategy. How can they be profitable going mm-hmm. forward? Like how many of the 30 newspapers do they really need to shutter right. to strengthen... So there's, it's, 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 you're absolutely right. It's like, how do we make the decisions about which ones to keep and which ones to shed? Right. But it's also the who gets to make that decision. And that's the other part of this with McClatchy. It's some, right, they've, we've already seen, like, the family's going to lose control mm-hmm. of this decision-making process. The decision about which ones are profitable, which ones aren't, is going to be removed from the family. And bankruptcy has this sort of, governance change as well. We end up having, when we file bankruptcy, there's a new entity and it has new fiduciary obligations. And here the fiduciary obligations are going to be to, and, the, and the control handed to those secured lenders. And We're someone with decision. no background in journalism, a hedge fund no is now going to be making those decisions based on, on, on what's valuable and profitable. And the other interesting thing they're going to have to do, which bankruptcy does allow for in this, in this collective way, is to figure out what do you do with all the pensioners, mm-hmm. which is a very different decision when you were the one who had hired right, the McClatchy family, let's say, like running the company. 
all you, they had more retirees than they have active employees. Mm-hmm. They've been laying off a lot of people Way in the more, past right. few years, right? What do you do with them? We might imagine that the head fund, hedge fund purchasers are going to feel much less of an emotional sort of pull to like, let's fund our pensions mm-hmm. uh, than would the original employer. So we're going to have to see a lot. What do we do with the pensions? Mm-hmm. And what bankruptcy also does is it could bring all those pension decisions into one collective proceeding where we could then negotiate with directly, in this case, it's going to be negotiations with the benefit, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corp, mm-hmm. the PBGC. Right. Uh, just this morning, um, the the court has approved, uh, they hired Judge Carey, retired Judge Carey from the District of Delaware to mediate those disputes mm-hmm. with the pen, uh, between the pensioners and the PBGC as to what's going to happen now with those pensions. They won't just be cut entirely. Right. Some of that is going to be able to be assumed by this this guarantee corp, mm-hmm. but under what terms and how many of them? They may not fully fund them. That's right. In perpetuity or whatever. Hmm. So the bankruptcy in this way, like so, in each of these cases, the bankruptcy brings like all these problems into a single proceeding mm-hmm. before a single judge, a single court, which has some efficiency benefits for the parties instead of having this scattered all around and you know multiple lawsuits we're in one proceeding mm-hmm. but once we once we get past that one proceeding the cases all look so different because what you're trying to solve in that one proceeding can vary tremendously so these cases really sort of show the breadth of bankruptcy and why many people say bankruptcy is one of the last generalist fields because mm-hmm. as a bankruptcy lawyer you end up having to deal with like you know the pension issues we have a mass tort I mean, in many ways, it's helpful to think of Boy Scouts as a, it's a mass tort. And mm-hmm. think procedurally, it's going to be really instructive to consi- think of that case more as like a Johns Mansville, sort of a, an asbestos problem, right. right? Where you're just sort of funneling litigation and coming up with a victim's compensation trust. Mm-hmm. To Pier 1, to what extent can Chapter 11 allow you to save a company with a broken business model? Right. And bankruptcy lawyers end up finding themselves like there's one common proceeding, but like a million different sort of problems walk in the door that you right. have to deal with throughout have to the learn case. a lot of new stuff. Learn a lot of new stuff. But at the end of the day, I guess one important lesson from this, and unfortunately th- my prediction for Pier 1 is that it'll prove this point. Bankruptcy can't save a company. Mm-hmm. Right? We always joke like bankruptcy couldn't save like the VCR. <laughs> right, it's like nothing you can do beta. to make people keep using beta and VCR. <laughs> right, there's gonna be a question: Is there anything bankruptcy can really do to preserve the brick and mortar retail store? Right. Sure. I mean, where's that gonna go? Um, so that I assume is is a, one of the major trends in in bankruptcy. Are we seeing more now, or is it just this week? There are a lot of big name bankruptcies. I mean, is bankruptcy kind of in in corporate America on the rise or kind of like it always has been? Kind of as it always has been. Retail has been on the rise in the corporate bankruptcy field. We're seeing more of it because these are, as we see bigger name retailers, Mm -hmm. then we pay more attention to it. But they've been happening. We've seen a lot of these. Even the smaller, but like I used to like Kosi, the sandwich it was like one of the early toasted sandwich places <laughs> right there in chapter 11 too. There's a lot of folks in that sort of s- that space, that mm-hmm. retail space who are trying to get rid of their big brick and mortar and try to use the model and use the chapter 11 process to sort of change their business model to something else. Like Cozy right, is going to go to a catering model. Right, a catering. I was thinking you can't really deliver sandwiches. No. Was, <laughs> That's right. not really a great market. Oh, yes, I'll have a drone bring your sandwich over right now. Your toasted, now soggy sandwich. Right. Mm-hmm. And we see, so we see a lot of retailers. We see the, all the coal companies are still going through multiple rounds of bankruptcy. Um, but overall, like we're still kind of waiting for Chapter 11s to pick up a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the practice hasn't been extraordinarily busy. When it has been active, it's been the Chapter 11 as a process of facilitating a sale. McClatchy is an example of that. It's going to be a sale, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Pier 1 is going to be a sale of probably piecemeal, the IP, the locations, etc. The one that seems like a most traditional, this is kind of 
surprising because the Boy Scouts in some ways seems like the anomaly, but it's actually in some ways the most traditional Chapter 11. Mm -hmm. We have an entity that's going in to resolve an issue of distress, but it's otherwise a viable entity. So we're not asking the judge to try to come up with a new business model. Mm -hmm. The business model is fine. They had this exogenous shock perhaps of their own doing, but an exogenous shock, and they they plan to emerge as the same entity. Mm-hmm. And that way, that's the most unusual, right? That's the traditional case that we the just don't see anymore. The traditional is unusual, right. Yeah. All right, Grace, anything else you can want to add in closing? So this is why, actually, I love bankruptcy and why I always encourage my students to take it. It's it's this fascinating procedure that can like solve and is requires solving a vast array of issues, Mm -hmm. torts, environmental law, labor issues. All of this ends up coming into one sort of one proceeding with a very tight deadline Mm -hmm. because the cash is running out. So I think these cases in many ways will be fascinating to follow, but I, I hope illustrate like or give some insight into why would anyone want to study bankruptcy? Right. It's got interesting stuff. Yeah. Yay, bankruptcy. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much, Drew. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh Thanks for joining us at The Explainer. If you like the show, leave us a five-star review with your podcast provider and ask your friends to subscribe. You can always drop us a comment at explainer at miami.edu. Our show is engineered and edited by Christopher Alzadi with theme music composed by Ray D. Kim from the Frost School of Music. I'm your host, Annette Uguez. Today's episode is brought to you by Miami Law's Bankruptcy Skills Workshop. Now in its 30th year, this CLE event presents the most useful basics on consumer bankruptcy practice in the Southern District of Florida. Coming up June 5th, 2020. For more information, visit law.miami.edu forward slash CLE forward slash bankruptcy.